The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society, for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Bogus Bankruptcy. The honest merchant who files a petition of bankruptcy does so to protect both himself and his creditors against total loss. But there are criminals who have made a major racket of fraudulent bankruptcy in this country who establish a legitimate business, then conceal their assets and resort to bankruptcy for the purpose of robbing their creditors. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI is a recent page from the record of its constant war against this federal crime. After a hard day in the office of the Davis Wholesale Fur Company, where he is credit manager, George Russell has just finished dinner and stretched out on the divan in the living room to read the evening paper. Oh, that that phone would ring just as I get settled down. Oh, don't get up, George. I'll answer it. Uh, thanks, Helen. Hello? Good evening, Mrs. Russell. This is Mr. Davis. Oh, good evening, Mr. Davis. Is David. your husband there? Yes, yes, he's right here, George. Oh, what does he want with me, I wonder? Well, he didn't say, honey. Oh, Helen's, I hope nothing's wrong. Here you are, dear. Uh, uh, thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir, Mr. Davis? Uh, Russell, I'd like you to come down to the office right away, if you will. Yeah, uh, yes, sir, of course. Is there, is there anything wrong? No, nothing that I'm sure you can't explain, all right. Oh, what do you mean? Well, I've just been going over your books, Russell, and I find several... Oh, the, uh, the books? Well, I'll just wait till you get here. You'll come right away, of course. Why, yes, sir, right away. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, Goodbye. Oh, dear. George, what's the matter? I I don't know, Helen, but I've got to go down to the office. Well, George, something's wrong. What is it? I I didn't know anything was, but... but, What is it, darling? Well, something about my books, he said. The books? Oh, where's my coat and hat? But what about the books, George? What does he mean? I, I have no earthly idea, Helen. But, but don't worry now. I, I'll get it all straightened out and be back home soon. But you're worried, George, and I've I can't... I've got to hurry now. Bye, honey. I'll see you in a little while. Goodbye, darling. Bye. Pardon me, mister. Oh, Yes? Are you George Russell? Uh, that's right. Why? I got something here for you. you. Oh. <laughs> okay, Red. Let's throw him in a car. Sit down, Mr. Davis. Thank you. I was just ready to go out to lunch. I'm sorry, Judge Forrester, but this is an urgent matter. Oh? What's the trouble? Well, it was just about a year ago that as my attorney, you helped me set up my wholesale fur business, wasn't it? Yes. Now you're going to have to help me take it apart. What? I want you to file a petition in bankruptcy for me. Bankruptcy? Yes, and I want you to file it today. My credit manager, George Russell, has left me no other choice, Judge. Well, what's he got to do with it? I found a few things wrong with his books last night and called him to come down to the office after dinner, but he never arrived. What happened? I don't know. He's just disappeared. I think you'll find the whole answer in these papers here. I see. I spent all night and this morning checking up. 
Through a system of false invoices and other juggling, Russell has gotten away with over $100,000 in furs. $100,000? Why? Why, it's incredible. Payments to my creditors are due, and I can't possibly meet them, Judge. I've got to take bankruptcy immediately. You reported Russell to the police, of course. Well, I thought I'd better consult you first. But Mrs. Russell, she must have reported it. Oh, I asked her to let me handle it. I see. Now, here are all the personal facts about Russell, and I made up a statement here of my true assets and liabilities. Yeah. And a record as nearly accurate as I could make of Russell's jugglings. Everything's here. I see. And you really want the petition filed today? Well, it's much better for my record for me to take action before my creditors do, Judge. Yes, yes, of course. Well, shall I call the police now? No, just leave everything to me, Davis. I'll check with you as quickly as I can. Good, good. I'll either be at my home or at my office. Very well. Good day, Judge. Good day. Miss Myers. Yes, sir? Get me the FBI. I'm glad you were cautious enough to call the FBI first, Judge Forrester. Well, it's like I said, Mr. Wells. The facts may be exactly as Davis presents them, but... How uh, long have you been his attorney, Judge? Since he established his business a year ago. But I've served him in only a couple of minor matters in all that time. And you suspect there might be something wrong with this case? I have no basis in fact for any suspicion, Mr. Wells, except that it all happened so quickly. Mm -hmm. Russell disappears last night. And this afternoon, Davis has statements all prepared and asked for a petition in bankruptcy. I see. And I certainly have no desire to be a party to any proceedings involving a possible fraud. Well, of course not. Judge, I want you to know that you must use your own judgment on Davis's request to file a petition in bankruptcy. I understand that. I'd like to have access to Davis's books as soon as possible. I can have them ready for you this afternoon. Good. I'm going to go out and have a talk with Russell's wife. Mrs. Russell, the FBI works as hard to prove a man is innocent as it does to prove a man guilty. But we do have to find your husband. Oh, I know, I know, and I want you to find him. What time did Mr. Davis call him last night? Right after dinner, about, uh, about 8 o'clock. And Mr. Russell left for the office right away? Oh, yes, he wouldn't keep Mr. Davis waiting. When did you learn that your husband hadn't reached the office? When Mr. Davis called again to see what was detaining him. When was that? About 10 o'clock. Mm-hmm. How long would it have taken him to have gotten to the office from here? Oh, not more than 20 minutes. Hmm. Seems strange that Mr. Davis would have waited two hours before calling. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Russell. We'll keep in touch with you on any developments. It is shortly after dusk now... And to anyone looking at it from the outside, the ramshackle building down in the now deserted warehouse section of the city would have appeared empty and unoccupied. But behind the padlocked loading doors stood a motor truck. And at a table sat two men playing gin rummy. Come on, pick a card, will you, Ray? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm adding something. You need under ten to knock. Yeah, yeah. Three on top of six, eight on five. I knock. How many? Ten. I'll lay them down, will you? Say, yeah. Uh, you got 14 points, stupid. How? Three and six is nine and five is 14. Since when? Look, Red, how many times you... Dates. Yeah. I get it. That's you, Mr. Davis? Come on in. Thank you. Well, how's things going up, Tanner? Huh? Right now, Mac, I'm more concerned with matters here. Everything's okay here. Red. Yes, sir. Did you call my apartment this morning? Yes, sir. Why? Well, to tell you everything was okay. I don't want either one of you to call me unless there's an emergency. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. How's our friend, Mr. Russell? <laughs> Sleeping like a baby. No trouble with him? Not since we slugged him. We were trying to make a break for it a while ago. That's why he's sleeping like a baby. Does he know why he's here? No, sir. You haven't mentioned my name. No, sir. What have you done with the first? Took him off the truck. 
Got them hid under that bunch of empty crates and boxes over there. Over there in the corner. Yeah, I see. It looks just like a pile of empty crates and boxes. I gather that, Red. Look, uh, Mr. Davis, you got any idea when we'll be pulling out? Huh? I just stopped by the lawyer's office to leave the books. He's filing the petition sometime tomorrow. Oh. You ought to get action pretty quick, then. Huh? That's right. Well, I have to be getting along. You boys just lay low here and everything will be all right. Right. Okay. And, uh, by the way, Mac. Yes, sir? I'll be back a little later on tonight to take care of Mr. Russell. <laughs> What have you got there, Bob? I stopped by Judge Forrester's office to pick up Davis's books. Here they are. Mm, good. I also checked Russell's bank account. And? He hadn't bothered to draw anything out of savings or checking. With $100,000 worth of furs, he wouldn't need to. Probably not. It really looks like he's our boy. Why? What have you got? A clean report on Davis from his bank and from the credit association. Which doesn't prove anything. But Davis didn't take a run out, and Russell did. Maybe Russell did, and maybe not. What do you mean? I want to go to work on these books first. And in the meantime, let's get out an eight-state alarm on Russell. What do we say he's wanted for? We can't say he's wanted for anything yet. All we know for sure right now is that Russell is a missing person. Yeah? Hey, David. Okay. Well, I didn't think you'd be back tonight, Mr. Davis. I told you I would. Where's Russell? In that room there. Red's with him. I want to see him. Okay, come on. Is he conscious? Yeah. You want he shouldn't be? No, no, no. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Russell. Oh, Mr. Davis. Oh, Mr. Davis, I'm, I'm so glad to see you. These men, they've been holding me here, holding me a prisoner. Yeah, I know. I, I don't understand it. I, I've tried to tell them that they've made a mistake. They've got the wrong person. They've I, made no mistake, I, Mr. Russell. Uh, what do you mean? I ordered them to bring you here. What? Sorry, but this is how it had to be done. I... I don't understand. It has to do with our books, Mr. Russell. Books? They show a deficit, a shortage of over $100,000. That's not true. Shut up and listen. Oh. <laughs> As I was saying, there's a serious shortage. So serious, in fact, that I'm forced to go into bankruptcy. I had nothing to do with any shortage. But you must have. Otherwise, why would you have disappeared? Now do you see why you're here, Mr. Russell? Yes. I believe I do. Unfortunately, keeping you out of sight until the bankruptcy case is over isn't enough. Your return even then would be very embarrassing. But you can't keep me here forever. That's right. So the next best thing, Russell, is to get rid of you. Get rid of you now. What are you saying? Red. Okay, Mr. Davis. No, wait, wait. P please, please, Mr. Davis. No shooting, Red. I'm not. Oh, no, no. Keep away. Keep, keep away. That helps us balance the books. We momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on the bogus bankruptcy. We will return to this case in just a moment. They say that a man has a young mind as long as he keeps his eyes fixed on the future, as long as he doesn't dwell in the past. Well, if that is true, then the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, in spite of being... 86 years old, is one of the youngest-minded organizations in the country. You see, the future is our business. For example, during the past few days, we signed several contracts which will not be paid up until after the year 2000. We provided for the college education of some boys and girls who will graduate in the class of 1966, took steps to protect the old age 
of men and women who have not yet turned 30. With the investment of equitable society funds, the same principle holds good. When we put the premium dollars of equitable society members to work, we're not thinking merely of 1947 or 1950. We're thinking of 1965 and 1975, of the future of the entire nation. And that is why equitable society funds are invested in ways that promote the long-range prosperity of our country, in farms and home ownership, in basic industries like steel, oil, textiles, aluminum, railroads, and many others. Yes, by serving the future of three and a quarter million members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to our file on the bogus bankruptcy. A criminal can plot only his own operations and the actions of his victims and confederates. The discoveries and movements of his law enforcement opponents he has no control over whatsoever. And in this handicap most always lies his nemesis. At this point, however, things seemed to be all in the bogus bankrupt's favor. And they still were when he entered his lawyer's office the following day. How's everything going, Judge? Well, fine, Mr. Davis. That's good. Have you filed our bankruptcy petition? To tell you the truth, uh, I haven't. But... Why not? I didn't finish checking your statements and figures in time. They were all checked before I gave them to you. I know, but I wanted to recheck them to make doubly sure no error would appear in the petition. <laughs> you don't think I might have made some mistake on purpose? Oh, of course not. It's just normal procedure on the part of any attorney to make sure that you uh, client... Judge, I want that petition filed today. It's being drawn up now. And you'll file it today? If the papers are finished in time, yes. Look, I'm paying you a good fee. I expect to get action. I'm doing the best I can. You wouldn't be stalling me, would you? What do you mean? I don't like the way you're handling this. This is all routine procedure. Where are my books? They're... they're not here. They're... Where are they? They're being re-audited. Why? For your protection against any possible error. I'm getting a little too much protection here, Judge. If you're not going to file today, I want my books and my statements back. As you wish. I think I'll take my case to someone who'll give his client what he asked for. I'll be back here for my books at 5 o'clock. Can I come in, Dick? Sure, Bob. What have you got? I just had a call from Judge Forrester. Yeah? Davis was in to see him. Kicked up quite a fuss about not getting any action. Uh -huh. Said he wanted his books back. In fact, he wants them no later than 5 o'clock today. I wonder what that's all about. I don't know, but I don't like it. That only gives us a couple of more hours. Well, let's take a look at those books again. Okay. Bob. Hmm? If Davis is the bad boy in the case... Where does Russell and his disappearance fit in? If Davis is the bad boy, then he caused Russell's disappearance. That's another reason we've got to move fast and get the facts. If there's something to get on, Davis... Hey, wait. What is it? Why hadn't I noticed that before? Noticed what? Look at the figures on that sheet. Yeah? Those with the check marks by them are the false entry figures. The others are on the level. Notice any difference? Hmm. Sure. Sure, they're not made alike. Exactly. Two different people worked on the books. And Russell was supposed to have done all the work. I'm going to run over to Davis's bank. What for? I want to pick up some of his canceled personal checks. And if Davis makes figures like any of these false ones here... Get going, Bob. Who is it? Me, Mr. Davis. Mac. What do you want? But I told you never to come here. This is father. important. Well? We got trouble, Mr. Davis. What's wrong? Red kind of messed things up. How? Getting rid of that Russell guy's body. What do you mean? What happened? Well, he, he took the stiff out to dump it late last night, just like you tell him. Yes? 
When he gets down by the docks, there were so many people around. A troop ship come in or something that he keeps a body in a car and he just keeps riding around. See? Very smart. Very. Then what? Well, when it gets to be daylight, he gets a little panicky. Finally, he throws a body in an alley. That's great. That's fine. Probably be found in the next five minutes. It's already been found, Mr. Davis. How do you know? Red come back and told me what he's done. I went over to see if I could pick the stiff up again. There's cops all around the place. That was just a little while ago. Oh, that's stupid. If the body had been weighted and thrown in the river, it would have stayed there for months. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, there's only one thing to do now. What's that? Go back to the warehouse. You and Red start putting the cases of furs on the truck right away. Okay. We're moving out tonight. <laughs> I just checked with the bank. Yeah? I think Mr. Davis is our man. The figures on his personal checks and the false entry figures in the books were made by the same person. I just confirmed it with the lab. I think I have even better confirmation on Davis. What's that? I just had a call from police headquarters. Russell's body was found. What? Picked up in an alley just a half hour ago. Well, are they sure it's Russell? His wife just identified the body. But that doesn't tie the murder to Davis. Mm, Not 100%. How was he killed? Did they find any weapon? No, but he was slugged with a heavy instrument. Of course, if Davis is our man, the murder makes sense. First, he has Russell snatched to make it look like a runout. Then he comes up with the book juggling charges and says $100,000 in furs are missing. Then he kills Russell to keep him from ever telling the truth. He should have done a better job of getting rid of the body. Dick, we've got to find those furs. And if we can prove Davis stole them, then we'll have him for murder, too. Where are we going to look? The first step is to get over to Judge Forrester's office and deliver Davis's books in person. It's 5.30 now. I don't think Mr. Davis is going to keep his appointment with you, Judge. No. Have you his home address? Yes, yes, I'll get it for you. Dick, I think you'd better get over there. Okay. I'll wait here. Hello? Hello? Yes, Dick? I just had the superintendent let me into Davis' apartment. Everything's been cleaned out. He's gone. I figured that. You'd better meet me back at our office. It's quite obvious that Davis has taken a run out. Yes. If we only knew where he's hidden those furs. Wait a minute. I seem to remember a certain item in his books. What? If I'm right, it might lead us to Mr. Davis. after 11 o'clock now, and down in the warehouse section of the city, a car with its lights off rolls quietly into an alleyway and stops. A man steps out and walks to a side door of one of the buildings. He knocks, pauses, then knocks again. That's funny. Red, Mac, where are you? Mac. Why, the dirty double crossing. Took the furs and ran out. Wait a minute, Davis. Uh, Huh? Your boys haven't run out on you. We have them in the office waiting for you. Who are you? Maybe I better flash this light on my credentials. The FBI. That's right. And thanks for that entry in your books covering the rental of this warehouse. Otherwise, the search for you might have taken longer. What do you mean? We have an interest in furs, too, Mr. Davis. Right now, we're concentrating on skunks. On the basis of subsequent evidence... Davis and his two confederates were tried and convicted for the murder of George Russell. It is an ironical paradox that in many instances, a law designed to protect the interests of the honest citizen can be turned by the criminal to his own profit. Such a law is that provision of the Federal Bankruptcy Act which permits a merchant to take voluntary bankruptcy. 
It is a just law, as has been proved in thousands of cases involving honest American merchants. But criminals have seized the opportunity it affords for cheating and robbing, and have made a fraudulent bankruptcy a major racket with total potential profits running into millions of dollars. But, as in the case of the criminal Davis, they inevitably run against the FBI and ultimately lose. You remember the old expression, cheaters never win? The FBI is determined to preserve its truth. You'll hear about next week's case in just a moment. This week at the Equitable Society, I had one of the finest experiences of my life. After lunch, I happened to drop in at the Department of Policy Claims. That's where payments are made to Equitable Society members whose policies have matured. Well, just as I walked into the office, an Equitable Society executive was handing a check to a lovely gray-haired lady. She'd been a teacher for 40 years until two weeks ago. Now she was retiring and receiving the first of a long series of checks which the Equitable Society will mail to her every month as long as she lives. Her eyes were shining when she took the check, and she said, You know, if I had my life to live over again, I'd still be a teacher. But if I couldn't be a teacher, I'd want to work for the Equitable Society. Because life insurance people, just like teachers, can look around them and see the results of their life work in happy, contented, responsible men and women. Yes, you see, the Equitable Society is the guardian not just of paper dollars and silver coins, but the guardian of human happiness, of the plans parents make for their children, of the ambitions of young married couples to own their own homes, and of the hopes of older people to live their declining years in peace and contentment. So we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States believe that our job is a good job, one that repays all the hard work we put into it. And so we're proud to say that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Allotment Swindle. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is your narrator, Dean Carlton, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is the American Broadcasting Company.